right, so let's see what we got here. What is this? This is a Schmidt Newtonian telescope. What the heck is that? So I'm here just outside of Washington DC for the summer and I needed another telescope for a stargazing event. And I just found out that my brother-in-law has this telescope that's been in his attic for the past 10 years. This is my brother-in-law, Aaron Nadler. What do we have? What, what is in the back of uh, this new truck here? I've got a telescope that's, you know, almost as vintage. What the heck is a Schmidt Newtonian telescope? Guess we're gonna find out. I guess we're gonna find out. This is Learn to Stargaze. All right, so we're here on the back deck and we're gonna put this thing together. We're gonna test it visually and then we might throw some astrophotography gear on and take some photos. If I put the tube on right now, we point it right at the sun and we can't get the lens cap out of the box. Oh wow, like there's not even a finer scope mount. It uses these, uh, that cap is really wedged in there. So when I first saw this telescope about 15 years ago, sitting in my father-in-law's living room, I simply figured it was a Newtonian. Now Newtonians generally have these spider arms holding the secondary mirror in place. The spider arms create spikes called diffraction spikes around bright stars, which make astrophotos look slightly more interesting, but are not always desirable. So when I saw this glass plate, I figured, cool, a different way to hold the secondary mirror so you don't get those spikes. But no, that's not the case at all. This glass is actually a Schmidt corrector plate. The primary mirror on this telescope is spherical, whereas a normal Newtonian is typically parabolic. A typical Newtonian, when used for astrophotography, suffers from coma. And to correct this aberration, you use a coma corrector in front of your camera. Coma is an aberration in the optical system that stretches out the stars at the edge of the image, making them look like little tadpoles. Here's an image taken with my regular Newtonian without a coma corrector, and you can clearly see the tadpole effect in the stars. The idea here is that the glass in front of the telescope combined with the spherical mirror creates a flatter image now, YouTuber Ed Ting did a video on this telescope last year, and although he encountered several challenges along the way, he was able to get some fantastic images. That said, he had his club members basically rebuild the telescope, making sure that the collimation was perfect, and he also used a separate mount. He didn't use this LXD55 mount that came with it. Now, there are a few of these telescopes kicking around the internet for sale at what appears to be a massive discount. So based on this video and Ed's video, I won't give a specific recommendation. I'll leave it up to you if you actually want to pick up one of these telescopes if you see one being liquidated. Now, some things to point out about this particular telescope, the Mead LXD55. And now this is the eight inch version of this telescope. There are tens and I believe 12s available as well. Now the finder scope on this telescope is connected to the body with just two screws. Now this is typical of scopes priced around $100 but most more expensive scopes have a proper mounting bracket. So keep this in mind if you're picking up the scope and plan to upgrade the finder, which you'll definitely want to do. And then there's the focuser. Yeah, it's interesting because the scope itself seems to be of incredibly high quality, but I have $200 telescopes with better focusers than this. It's just a cheap plastic thing. There's no slow motion control and it even has some play. But will it turn on? Oh, there you go. all right. Where are you going? Just checking. I didn't press anything. The screen's black and it's moving by itself. That was weird. Not done being weird. Yeah, the controls don't seem to be doing anything. Oh! <laughs> what is happening? It might be like a night mode. So we just plugged the telescope in and it just started moving all over the place. Like five degrees at a time in random directions. Memories of Messier Marathon's past. All right, so I've set the telescope up here in the garage to see if I could diagnose what the issue was, why the telescope came to life and started slewing in all sorts of random directions as soon as we plugged it in. And it seems like the reason is the cord for the hand controller 
may have a short in it, and what seemed to fix the problem, at least so far, is to put the cord in the other way. So I took it out of the telescope, uh, the side that was plugged into the telescope, and I plugged it into the hand controller, and the side that was in the hand controller, and plugged it into the telescope. And now it seems to work just fine. All right, so the next thing I wanna test is can I control this mount from my iPhone using the ASI Air app? Now, I've got the VGA cable that came with this old telescope, and I've got a VGA to USB cord right here. So we're gonna connect these together. And then I've got an ASI Air connected to this telescope here. So I'm gonna run a cable over from USB to uh, through the VGA to the phone cable cord connection that is accepted by this telescope. So the ASI Air is on. This uh, mount is on and I've done a, a pretend two star line. So in the settings here, I chose the mount named Mead LX90 slash a bunch of other stuff. All right, by smashing a bunch of buttons on the hand controller, we can see that the mount actually responds and this is pretty cool. So our next step for tonight is to move the camera over from uh, the little sharp star scope here over to this, uh, the Mead and see if we can take a photo. So this is pretty cool. I've got the two telescopes set up here and the moon is just starting to come above the horizon. I believe this is the full moon tonight. And that looks super cool. I know this is filmed on an iPhone and it doesn't look that great, but believe me, this is pretty cool. So the reason I've got both telescopes set up here is that this telescope doesn't have any mounting brackets. Um, but what I am gonna do, I'm gonna move the camera over and I have a long enough USB cord to reach from the ASI uh, Air, which is sitting on this scope over to the camera, which will be attached on this scope. All right, so, so far we've got everything working that needs to be working. This is a live view. You, you can see that there's definitely clouds covering the moon and then we can see Jupiter right there as well. All right, it took me seven minutes, but the scope is polar aligned to an accuracy of 43 arc seconds. So that is pretty darn good. So I'm gonna try to focus on Deneb here. We were able to center on the star precisely. I'm gonna go over to frame and focus and let's see if we can improve this focus and then try and take a picture of M27 to be our first target. So after resetting this mount three times and <laughs> turning on and off the ASI Air, I think we're finally getting a good exposure. So I've taken flats and uh, using an old dark and an old bias and so let's see if <laughs> if this will actually produce a good image you know what that's not bad we've also got the full moon to deal with um and the fact that we're not guiding and i'm using 30 second exposures so if i were able to get this telescope for 500 dollars and save money on the coma corrector yeah I would definitely consider this. Hi. Hi, is it here? Is it the I think, I think so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just the uh, in-laws. Oh, okay. Well, I think I'm gonna call it a night. The mount uh, basically just up and died on me. I don't know what's going on with it. But <laughs> I finally got the moon in frame and you can see here with the mount dead, it's slowly drifting away. But it looks pretty good. Um, I'm actually, a, starting to like this telescope. It's got the coma around the edges, um, but if you just crop that out, it's it's pretty straightforward to get a pretty good view of what you want to see. All right, so after using this telescope for several hours, what are my final thoughts? First, the mount. I had a perfect polar alignment, but it still wouldn't track for over 30 seconds without star trails in an image. At one point, it just started spinning around in circles, and the declination knob that jammed onto the declination motor, and it took all my strength to wedge it free. I also had to cycle the power and realign the scope several times over the course of the evening for various reasons. Now, visually, mount aside, this scope performs great. There was a full moon, and so I looked at the moon, and the view was clear and crisp. I did use this telescope about 12 years ago to see galaxies from dark skies, and it was pretty good at that job as well. And last night, I was able to get two images. One, a 30-second image of M27, and a second 30-second image of M13. Now, keep in mind, this is two successful images. I tried to take maybe 10 or 15, 
And the primary reason I wasn't able to get more success in the images was the quality of this mount. Keep in mind, I also wasn't auto-guiding because I didn't have a mounting bracket to put the auto-guider on. So how does using this telescope, aside from the mount, compare to using my regular Newtonian of the same size? I actually think if you were to upgrade the focuser and the finder, using this telescope would be just as effective as my regular Newtonian with a coma corrector. I may just crop the images around the edge to get rid of some of the coma that remains after using this telescope. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Schmidt Newtonian Telescope. Check out my latest book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, the world's most famous stargazing list, and learn how you can earn certificates for your observations. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And remember, the future is looking up.